Hey everyone, uh, I'm your host Mike Vaughn. Uh, this is a new series that I have called Rotten Cinema uh, and I basically invite some very talented people to talk bad movies uh, and what could be more fun than that. Um, and I'm really excited because as you can see I'm not alone here. Uh, I am joined by Peter Hurd. Uh, he is a self-taught horror uh, filmmaker and author. Uh, his credits include The Control Group which has the iconic Brad Dorif. Um, we're going to talk about that more later because I want I want some Brad Dorif stories. But um, since the film's release, he's been more focused on writing, uh, even making the semifinals in several screenwriting competitions and publishing short stories. And I also heard that you have uh, a new uh, book coming out, right? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for for having me on um, to talk about some wonderfully bad movies and um yeah so the book i have coming out is called uh zolo or sholo uh if you want to pronounce it correctly spanish way um so x-o-l-o -O for people who aren't familiar which is a breed of dog better known as the mexican hairless uh they are believed by the aztecs to be the guardians of the underworld so this is a horror novel it's my debut horror novel um that's kind of based around that legend. It's about an American businessman who adopts a Zolo while on a business trip to Mexico. Uh, finds it to be a bit unruly and even more worryingly finds out that it can absorb the souls of the dead. So he abandons it in the wilderness where it's picked up by a dog fighting ring. Um, and it ends up leading a revolution of the dogs against the humans. Uh, so it's a kind of animal uprising, uprising tale. Wow. That sounds really amazing. Like, uh, I, I love when, you know, you can, like, somebody can give me, like, a log line, and I'm, like, I'm hooked. I need to read that. Um, you know, will you direct the movie, or, or, or like... I I, I hope so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm planning it as maybe like a three-part miniseries or something. I kind of have the scripts. I, it's got kind of funny. I um, Since I was more familiar writing screenplays, I wrote this story as a screenplay first. Um, kind of thinking it could be a movie. And when I did the screenplay, it was about 300 pages long, wow. which if you think, um, you know, a page of screenplay is a minute of screen time, a 300 minute movie would be pretty long, <laughs> even for nowadays. So I'm like, okay, mini series. Once, once it gets to that point, do streaming mini series. Oh, that sounds awesome. Um, like who would be like, okay, so like, ideal casting uh for the lead uh if you could cast anybody who would it be like who would be your main uh probably jason bateman because i mean it's mm. if it's a streaming miniseries you're required by law to have jason bateman in it yeah it's just that's i don't make the rules that's just what it is. <laughs> well yeah yeah you don't make the rules that's just that's how, how it works <laughs> but um you know like so i'm in the festive spirit here um oh. I, you know, because we're talking about Blood Rage, uh, one of my favorite 80s, um, maybe just favorite 80s movies, period. I love it. Um, <laughs> so just, you know, I'm going to Vanna White this a little bit. Uh, oh, I like the, it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Yeah. This is the deluxe uh, Arrow edition. Um, ah. But uh, yeah, I, so I'm really excited because you he said to me that this was your first time watching it. So I'm going to like, let you kick this off. Uh, what, what did you think of this? Um... Um, yeah. So it, this is one that's been on my list for a long, long time. It's one of those movies. Um, I watched it on Tubi. Well, we're not sponsored by them. Just a little, little shout out to them. Um, it's been on my list there for probably two years. And it's just one, there's so many movies on there. I've never gotten around to watching it. So I was really glad when you mentioned this one, I'm like, yes, I've always wanted to watch it. It's the day before Thanksgiving as we're recording this, so uh, you know I'm I'm uh, uh, perfect timing to watch it. Um, so I'm glad I finally got the chance to watch it, and it is crazy. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a big fan of the '80s slasher, um, especially the holiday themed slashers. Um, you know, all the Christmas themed slashers are great, but there's not very many Thanksgiving themed, uh, especially slasher movies. I can only think of this and Thanksgiving. And uh, yeah, there's oh, there was another one uh, because I feel like uh, I don't want some fans coming after me. Uh, it's like <laughs> Home Sweet Home, I think, is. Um, oh, OK. Yeah. Little, yeah. Like, well, and that's uh, a, I don't know if that's ever gotten at least a U.S. release, but that one is is still a little obscure. But um, yeah. And there might might be like a few here and there. But like 
as far as like notable ones, you're right. Like there, there totally hasn't been a lot. And uh, I kind of love how this uh, movie has, has certainly gained uh, a lot of like cult uh, traction in the last couple of years, especially with, yeah. you know, the era release. Um, Joe Bob did it on his show and that brought uh, probably like a huge new audience. Um, mm. So, um, I yeah. So this movie, this movie is insane, but I really love how it kind of, does capture that very weird dysfunctional family element yep to a thanksgiving movie um yeah yeah and if you're gonna have like a mother that's kind of like out there spacey i mean louise lasser is like this is perfect casting so i wish i had a great story to go with this but i did get to meet her uh one time nice um yeah she um i mean she's like like her snl uh stint was like stuff of levit legends i mean she just yep. was like um let's just say she's a character we'll just go with that yep. it seems nice nice to say yeah. um but yeah uh she kind of makes this movie i mean i i really like um like the main guy that plays like Todd and his twin brother, um, yeah. Mark Soper. That sounds sorry right. Yeah. Sorry like if that. I'm saying that wrong, but like, yeah, he's great. Um, but yeah, like Louise Lasser is, is iconic in this. I like, no, I, I think about it. I don't like, I love that scene where she's like spread Eagle at the refrigerator, eating the leftovers. Um, <laughs> I identify with that. Yes, uh, that's where yeah. we're all going to be in a couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny because like, uh, since we're kind of talking about her, it, it's interesting because I never really understood why she had pigtails. But um, like when I first saw this, I wasn't really familiar yep. with like her character um on how was it um mary hartman mary hartman which i guess yep. she sported sports the the pigtail so i guess maybe the director wanted her in that but it's just it's really weird because i'm like why is she trying to look like a child yeah it was very weird especially because in the the opening scene of the movie everyone is supposed to be 10 years younger than they are in the rest of the movie you know so that bit i'm like why did they cast like i thought they were trying to pretend she was like a teenager like a young teenager i'm like this woman (laughs) is clearly you know middle age this is not convincing at all if she's a teenager there i mean that's rough like that is rough level uh aging but Yeah. yeah um so speaking of the intro um it is such a great way to kind of establish um the film and its tone um did you catch the Ted Raimi cameo? Oh yes, yes, the uh, the <laughs> condom salesman in the bathroom, which uh, right. every every horror movie needs a Ted Raimi cameo, I think. Oh, absolutely! Like that should be law. Like, yeah, uh, he, from here on out, that's. You know. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think like in a broader sense, what I I love about this movie is, you know, you, I mean, you've seen a lot of slashes like I have, and a lot of them just take themselves very seriously, mm-hmm. like maybe too seriously. And like, I, I get the sense that this really um, is in on the joke. Like it knows yep. it's, it's a cheesy uh, 80s slasher film. Right. So yeah, I, I like the, the fact that it kind of like lets us um, be in on the joke. And I, I mean, some of it I think is still maybe unintentionally funny, but yes. yes. Um, yeah so i i don't think we're quite ready for spoilers yet but like um how like what would you say is like do you have a favorite part i mean the the special effects in this is is like fantastic yeah i was i was very surprised the effects especially for how kind of early it was i think it was filmed in 83 or so it wasn't released until a lot later but um for how good the effects were. I mean, compare it to any of the Friday the 13th at the time, you know, it's honestly better than the first couple of Friday sequels or most of the kind of indie slasher movies of the time. 
and the kills were very uh very creative throughout <laughs> yeah and you know what's um to piggyback off that um ed french uh who makes a camp like speaking of cameos that's kind of yeah. one of the the great cameos in this um yeah. uh but anyways he um you know ed french did the effects and now he's like oscar nominated um yeah you know he's worked on many huge projects um yeah. just recently um did make um was the makeup artist on amsterdam right okay wow yeah so he yeah. is uh, still working still like kicking ass but it's so kind of awesome to see him in this like um late 80s slasher but also again a fun cameo from him um so it's interesting because this movie has uh, some different cuts. Um, I kind of am a purist and I just go with the home video version of it. Right. But um, I definitely kind of like how there's um, like the video version. I think there's a the the theatrical and then there's like a sort of amalgamation version that um, that's this is also not sponsored by Arrow, but I just had this as a visual. <laughs> yes. Um, but it has this like weird hybrid version of it. Um, right. So, um, yeah. And this it's funny because I feel like this movie, um, you know, it does have its detractors and I can kind of see where stuff gets a little repetitive. Um, like it's not cranberry sauce. <laughs> they kind of hammer that home. But, you know, yeah. I... I don't mind it because the movie kind of establishes that it's just a weird movie. It's just a yeah. weird vibe. Yeah. And the weird thing is like, I thought right away there could have been a much more like serious kind of smarter version of this movie. Right. Cause the whole premise is it's two twins. One of them's a murderer. One of them's not, but we know the the characters believe that it's the other way around, right? They believe the character who is a murderer is innocent. The one who's innocent is a murderer, but we know not. But there easily could have been a version of this movie where it was more, you know, ambiguous, right? It could have been more like a psychological thriller. We don't know, you know, is it this brother? Is it the one who was in the insane asylum? We don't know. But the movie doesn't even toy with that at all. We yeah. know <laughs> right from the opening scene who's good, who's bad. It's clearly stated again and again so it's just interesting like you would you feel like the whole idea generally of having like an identical twin plot in movies is to have them get confused with each other and the audience yeah. doesn't know which one's good and bad but this movie doesn't doesn't even toy with that at all it's like it's, nah it's fine yeah. no no that's a great point uh that you brought up because yeah i definitely do feel like it would have been nice to maybe play up that uh you know ambiguity um right. a little bit more but yeah, I mean, and it's funny because it's not that I want to say that this movie's not ambitious because I do think that for a lower budget uh, slasher film, it looks good. I mean, again, yeah. as we mentioned, you know, Ed French's um, like effects are like fantastic. Um, but uh, yeah, it definitely um, feels a little like first draft material um yeah like maybe another pass or two would have been nice but <laughs> yeah. um um you know and it's it's like fun to kind of have like one of the like it's awesome because i know you're also a big fan but one of the cool things is like you're you know a director too so you have that kind of interesting perspective uh on films it's funny because like i'm sure when you watch films now as a a director you're like I would have did it this way or I would have like, right. Is that, is that pretty accurate? Yeah. I think it, I, it, less bad now I've learned to kind of step away from that, but yeah, I do always find myself saying like, Oh, I would have done it this way. I would have changed this <laughs> except on blood rage, you know, 10 out of 10. N no, no, it's, you know, I, I don't think anything it could have been improved. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it, it's like, I do love movies that are just so, unabashedly themselves right yes, like this movie yes. is certainly not it, i don't know there's there's this interesting trend lately and here's the thing i don't automatically hate on like elevated horror i know that gets like it, it's right. such a dirty word um i think there's a place for every kind of horror um yeah. but i think 
I I understand certain fans' frustrations with that because it's almost like they're ashamed of it being a horror movie, so they have to right. sort of dress it up a little bit. Um, right. I think that's maybe a little too simplified, but just for my point, um, I think that you do love when a movie's just like, I'm fucking weird as hell, and you're, yeah. you know, you're gonna be on this ride with me, whether you like yep, it or not. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm trying to think like, again it's so weird that there's not more like thanksgiving horror films or like yeah um i always thought and and i'd love to hear your opinion on this but i always thought your next would would have been great set at thanksgiving time that makes a lot of sense actually it kind of almost feels like it probably was at some point Mm. because i don't even remember what the it was just like a family reunion that, yeah it didn't really have an explanation it almost feels like it was a thanksgiving or christmas story at some point and they you know some executive gave them a note and they wrote it out but um um but yeah it is interesting that there aren't very many uh thanksgiving movies and that might have something to do with their just thanksgiving just kind of being a u.s only yeah. holiday you know so it's just, you know so, so much of the audience for these low budget horror films is international you know maybe they think you know, Thanksgiving wouldn't uh, wouldn't be relevant in the same way to an international audience. Yeah, you know, that's, a, I mean, that's um, a really interesting point that I never really considered, but like, yeah, um, it would kind of have maybe like a limited appeal. Um, and I think like what's, what's kind of brilliant about this is like, I mean, no matter where you're from, I think we all love slasher movies. Like there's something... Oh, yes inherently kind of fun um ridiculous um i know there's kind of a lot to be you know said about like real life violence but i think that i like you know i'm a horror fan because it it lets me sort of get the vessel reaction without actually having to um like see real shit like this so right um not to get too off, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I I'm trying to think like what else uh, is great about this movie besides everything. I I do really love again how you know family is kind of always weird and awkward, uh, right. and you always kind of have that like kooky person in the family um and i'm kind of wondering um if the if like louise lasser's character is just supposed to be such a weirdo or if that's Mm. just kind of what she brought to the table so they're like let's go with it yeah because i don't know how much like if you you know i always try to like kind of reverse engineer the script from the actual movie, like how much, you know, this was actually written on the page. Sorry, my dog is going crazy. I don't know if you can hear him in the background. (laughs) Um, But he, uh, but the script, um, you know, I don't know how much of her character is really in the script because she doesn't have much of like, it's not so much the dialogue she has or like what she actually has to do in the story. It's more just like the way she performs it is where the kind of kookiness of her character comes in. Yeah, like she at one point is just anxiety cleaning while drinking wine. I love that. Um, It's like stuff that you feel like you never see as an audience member. Like, um, I feel like, you know, you can speak to that as a director of like, you're, you know, I'm like, I want to see that. And some wonderfully weird directors like uh this is you know this is going to be the the you know part of my movie part of my vision um you know to you um when you when you like tackle uh, a film i'm sure you're like what do i want to see in a movie that i haven't seen like what what can i like what's something so weird and different that i can bring that is you know wholly unique to what i'm offering yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're always trying to bring something, you know, especially with horror, it's very weird because you kind of think, like, what hasn't been done in horror? And the answer is, 
really nothing. Everything's been done. Yeah. It's been done, you know, <laughs> in every possible variation. It's been done a million times. That was kind of like when I did, not to get off topic too much, but when we did the control group, my first film or my first real film, um, a, a lot of the goal was like, you know, we have all these kind of cliches of horror films, but let's try to do kind of all of them in the same movie. I don't know if that's really been done. So there's ghosts and there's, mad scientists and there's you know kind of every cliche kind of all thrown in into one movie um you know so you try to do something that uh has never been done before which is very hard to do yeah um and you know like it's so interesting because again i it must be so difficult because i feel like we've seen everything like yeah like I, I'm always so impressed when a filmmaker can shock me or like kind of jolt me in a way that I'm like, wow, I, cause I don't know if, if you're like, I'm, I try not to be like super cynical, but like, mm. uh, I think that just comes with age. Um, <laughs> and that you've, you know, been there, done that. Um, yeah. so, um, I, I, also forgot to mention this isn't really a thanksgiving horror but it is something that i have watched every thanksgiving regardless uh blood freak have you heard of this one the name sounds familiar but i don't know if i can place it um it is a masterpiece <laughs> it is so bad it's amazing um it you know uh, the 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 short version of it is uh killer turkey that drinks the blood of drug addicts and it's also a religious movie that sounds incredible Mwah. it's I'm... amazing um that let me just look up really quick if it's streaming anywhere um probably to be um that's that's the world's uh catching ground for all all bad horror movies these days uh, I don't know how you do Killer Turkey and don't do it as a Thanksgiving film. It's just yeah, no, it's just yeah. like incidental. Like he's on a turkey farm and shenanigans <laughs> happens. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll I'll see where it's streaming. It's got to be somewhere, probably yeah. YouTube if not. But uh, I would be remiss in that. And you know, it's funny because I want to pivot just for a little bit. Um what are your favorite like not necessarily thanksgiving movies but like st like stuff that kind of puts you in that mood like what's like do you have any go-to films that for thanksgiving specifically yeah um i never thought about it i don't think um you know i think maybe that's like about the time i would start watching like a the christmas themed horror movies you know silent yeah. night uh deadly night and all those i mean it's endless killer santa movies um but yeah i can't think of any that are really tied to thanksgiving for me because there's not that many that have that uh that theme so what i've been trying to, to do is like not necessarily like thanksgiving but just like fucked up families yeah okay um so like that's a little bit of a broader kind of um like stoker is kind of my go-to um, oh okay yeah yep. like that is a beautiful monument to just messed up families and i feel yes. like um that's a good one like there's um i have so it's wild but like have you heard of dutch dutch sounds um, familiar so it is a 1991 comedy that i believe is set on thanksgiving or around the holidays Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't directed by John Hughes, but it was written by Hughes. Um, okay. It is very hard to find. Um, it's not streaming anywhere that I could find. Um, but it has Ed O'Neill sort of at, at the height of his married with children fame. Um, okay. And essentially it's him in this like ultra 90s, early 90s, like brat. I think he might be like romantically involved with the mom and he's like trying to win over her son and they like weirdly like it's like a road trip movie okay this sounds familiar the description of it sounds familiar yeah That's it was like for it being a john hughes yeah script, at least that it's so obscure it's um it, it was i think a lot of people 
probably have like vague recollections just because it was such a cable staple. Like it was. Yeah, always... I'm sure I probably if I didn't yeah. see it on cable as a kid, I'm, I probably saw it at the video store at some point or something. And I always wonder like why it's been out of print for so long. It's got to be. It's got to be like a rights issue. Um, it's 20. Uh, I just looked it up and it is 20th Century Fox, which is now um, 20th Century Disney. So right. uh, my hope is that they like re-release that or at least put it up on Disney Plus or Hulu or somewhere. But yeah. um, since we're talking okay. about Thanksgiving movies, that one is is I remember it being pretty good. It might not be as good as I remember, though. Right. Well, maybe maybe Disney will remake it now. They seem to be remaking <laughs> yeah. the catalog. So, um, and then of course, there's trains, planes, and automobiles. You can't yes. talk about yeah, like that's yes, the the quintessential. Um, like that also is a, an '80s John Hughes. Yeah, um, so like that uh, the holiday theme. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny, and and I I will get back into Blood Rage, I promise. But like we were taught, um, I was talking um about planes trains and automobiles on the video attic and that and like the john hughes isms that he seems to put in all his movies i mean they are, are very uniquely his like uh sentimental but with like a edge which with with that um kind of almost dark edge yeah at times, um yeah which i i love um I think it's hard. I mean, I think like people try to replicate that that blend or balance, right? And it usually doesn't work. He usually like, I'm not saying that it's impossible nowadays, but it's like that very specific line to walk. Well, when you're a writer, I mean, you you yeah. you should definitely know that. Like, I'm sure like tonally um, balancing all that stuff is probably not um, easy. No, I think tone is probably the hardest thing to get right, I think. That's, that's definitely the thing I see, you know, in both in my own experience and in, in kind of beginner writer stuff. I think tone is always kind of the hardest thing to master. Yeah. Um, and it also uh, seems like just um, mixing genres, kind of. I mean, not that, like, um, like, those movies are just purely comedy, but, I mean, there definitely are, like, blends of other, like genres in a way um like lampoon's uh, christmas vacation is like the classic christmas movie but also um demented yes way. yes um, exactly. so um but yeah um we'll, we'll pivot back to blood rage but i wanted uh like i want to be able to have detours in this podcast oh yes so, um Absolutely. so yeah um I, I definitely, um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else uh, that's been left unsaid. I just think it's a glorious, cheesy, um, again, I love that it's very self-aware. Like, it, yes. um, like, it knows it's a piece of crap. But, you know, darn yep. it, it's going to be the best piece of crap that you've ever seen. Yeah, and just doesn't even <laughs> doesn't even seem to care. It's actually maybe it has a little bit more in common with something like Thanks Killing than just the uh mm. just the time period. It's almost like it is just kind of gloriously bad. Uh one thing I noticed I thought was very odd is most of these 80s slasher movies, they kind of spend the first part of the movie, you know, they establish the set of characters, they get them at a set, you know, a remote location. You kind of spend time with all the characters and then they gradually all get killed off till there's only, you know, one or a few left. And this one kind of does that. It establishes this group of characters at the beginning, but then it just kills them all off. And then it just keeps introducing new characters and killing them off. Like they kill off the main cast, you know, after half an hour and they just have to keep introducing new random people. You're like, who, you know, who is this guy who's entering 45 minutes into the film then he's dead an hour in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is very weird. That's a great point. Um, because I mean, this movie's just so like it. If it, it definitely doesn't really follow conventional rules or logic, and right. you know, screenwriting and directing one on one is like you don't introduce new characters, you know, like well into maybe the hour mark of your yeah. your film. Um, right. But again, I it, it's so funny because like I just sort of accept it because that's 
the the roles that this kind of set um yep. so i know you touched upon this a little bit but like uh as far as like having it be a little bit more am ambiguous but like you know i thought this could be kind of fun as a as a, a writer and director how how else would you maybe like shape or it, like 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 let's say you got the remake rights to this but like yeah. what would be your angle yeah i think it would be interesting to do something more ambiguous where you you think that at first that it's just going to be a straight horror movie. You think that the brother who's in the insane asylum is the killer and that he's broken loose and that's, you know, who's doing all the killing. And you could even show it because they're identical twins, you know, and they're played by the same actor. Um, you know, so you could even show them the killing. Pure, the audience wouldn't know that they're looking at a different character than they think they're looking at. You know, but you could have some hints throughout, you know, because the, the, I'm getting them confused now because of Todd and Taryn. I think Todd was the one who was in the insane yeah. asylum. He was the one who's innocent. He's, his kind of, his character arc, his struggles, he's trying to convince the other characters that he's really innocent. And it just seems weird because we as the audience, we know that he is. But the audience, uh, the characters just don't believe him at all. So it just, it, it leaves it with, like, not a lot of tension in his storyline. Um, you know, because the, the characters just never buy into it at all. But if you had it, like, the character, he had some sort of evidence, I don't know what it would be, some sort of proof that, uh, you know, he really is innocent or that his brother really is the killer. You know, he could, like, kind of um, buy the sympathy of some of the characters and it would be kind of a gradual kind of more psychological thing where um you know you're trying to prove that the other brother really is the killer hmm. yeah that's um i mean i think like yeah that all by itself would would really again i think elevate it um make it a little more interesting also uh it's todd and terry i don't know why i was thinking rod and todd from uh <laughs> <laughs> other other fictional brothers i i thought i think the same thing too whenever there's a brother named todd <laughs> speaking of but, siblings you can easily get confused for each other yeah um i'd like to think in a, in a small way matt Groening was was referencing um blood rage uh it could be it could be it's not the only uh horror obscure horror reference in there so hey like he's never he's never uh said no so yeah there you go. There you go. <laughs> like uh, uh, speaking a little off topic, but speaking of um, Simpsons horror references, you have ever seen um, "I Bury the Living" fifties mm -hmm. movie? I'm one hundred percent sure that's where grounds groundskeeper Willie came from. Yeah, you know? could, um, that's awesome. I can see that. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely the writers. I mean, it. it I also fully acknowledge that is like the the biggest stretch in the world but uh <laughs> in my fantasy world i like to think that yeah like like, like that's a blood rage reverence but yes um, i like to think everything's a blood rage uh yeah it's not... it's the it's the ur text of uh of western <laughs> literature all all things are descended from blood rage yeah i mean everybody thinks it's citizen king but i mean it's blood rage yeah yeah um, right <laughs> so um but yeah i think i was also trying to think about like if i um would remake this um i think i would definitely spend more time exploring the mother son dynamic in a really yeah. in more interesting way um i i want to keep this like relatively spoiler free um mm -hmm. but i think the like twist wasn't set up uh that great what do you yeah. think yeah, I was a little, I was a little, I won't spoil it, but I was a little confused by by the ending. Um, it, it did feel like it kind of came out of nowhere. So yeah, that is something that could be more set up. Yeah, like I kind of maybe see where they're going with it. But again, I think that it's, it's, it's funny because, and I mean, I'm sure you can speak, speak to this, but doesn't it feel like there was some stuff maybe like, this almost feels like there were a much more robust uh, script and some of this context had been cut out. Yeah, that could very well be. I mean, maybe it was just for time or maybe the the financiers, you know, say we don't want this character development stuff. We want the focus on the slashing and killing. You know, that's entirely possible. 
um, or maybe just things were shot and cut for time. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, it would really be fascinating if this did get a remake. And it's one of those that like, so uh, I, I'd love to hear what you think, but like, I definitely don't auto hate on remakes. I think that while yes, the majority of them are kind of awful, there are yeah. there are the ones that kind of sneak in there and are really great. Uh, right. Even, you know, some would say better than the original. And right. the biggest complaint I hear about like remakes is like, why are you remaking great stuff? Well, I mean, right. you you know probably better than than anybody that like it's name recognition. You yeah. already have a built in audience. Yeah. Um, so the answer is like marketing, but like people are like, why don't you remake something that like Blood Rage where like it's not, I mean, it's a cult masterpiece, but it's not an untouchable, uh, you know, Rosetta Stone of movies. Um, right. The the average audience member does not know what Blood Rage is, you know, the way they know what Friday the 13th or Halloween is. Yeah. Um, yeah and i and it's so funny because just talking it out like there's so many really interesting avenues you could take this again uh you know it being a little bit more ambiguous about the twins maybe like focusing more on like the mother son thing i mean i i got the like an incest vibe what do you, what do you think it entirely possible um there is yeah there does seem to be a very strange uh dynamic and there was a very weird like i said i've only watched the movie once but there's there's almost a weird bit where the mom seems to know that they have the wrong son Mm -hmm. you know like she seems to know that the wrong son is there and she doesn't seem to do anything about it so it's like why you know you know why (laughs) why she do that who knows um yeah and like i said i think it just maybe stems from there being multiple um scripts and then just yeah. some stuff getting cut out but some stuff getting left in where you're like okay that doesn't quite connect with yeah you know. um but uh i still love it i love it for the mess that it is and yes. it is such a glorious mess like i'm like if you're gonna if you're going to swing i think just swing as big as you can yeah absolutely absolutely um and uh yeah i'm probably um that is probably a great place to sort of um wrap up a little bit but like um before we end is there any like you know you mentioned your new novel which sounds amazing um you know is there any other like projects that you're working on or anything that you can kind of talk about at this stage yeah a couple a few, i don't know about anything i can really talk about you know i'm always i have a few film scripts that i'm always trying to develop and push forward but you know the last movie the control group we did that back in 2012 which was kind of when the indie horror indie film market was really starting to collapse and in the decade since it has just almost collapsed completely it's really bad trying to get indie films off the ground so you know especially at the very low budget levels so you know i have some film projects some scripts that i'm trying to push forward but it's you know it's always getting the money um but then as far as books um i have my next novel i'm about halfway through the first draft of that and then i'm also working on a sequel to zolo as well so i'll have some more some more book projects to come out but people can always follow me on uh twitter and instagram and tiktok to get updates on that yeah and i'll be sure to um like link all of your social is um in the description and um like where they can check out your stuff um and uh yeah it has been really fun talking about this like really weird movie but also like you know talking a little about your about your books and your projects uh that sounds amazing um like i'm still like turning over that plot in my head and i'm like (laughs) i'm very sold i you know (laughs) excellent (laughs) um so thank you again um I hope you all like this little experiment episode. I, you know, we'll probably be toying around with the format, but the, you know, the one uh, constant is I'm going to be talking about bad movies and I'm going to be having talented people uh, talking about it with me. So uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah. Thank you.